um, it's, it, you, All right, so welcome to um, the second event of our Accelerating Climate Resilience Speaker Series. Um, today, again, um, we'll do an introduction of our guest speakers. We're so thrilled to have them and so thankful that they're able to join us today. Um, but we're definitely looking forward to um, see the, to, to uh, un better understand the work no, that they do, no, worry. as gonna, well as, um, if you are able to just mute your computer, um, that would be great. Um, and so we'll get going. But looking forward to hear from them. And then hopefully we can also um, have some time to have questions that you are able to also connect with our speakers as well. So just a few Zoom logistics. Um, going forward, we'll have a presentation from our guest speakers. Um, please put your questions in the chat uh, and, and we will collect in and um, coordinate that with our guest speakers um, to have that uh, Q&A sessions at the, at the, at the end. If uh, to use the chat, there is an icon at the bottom of your screen that, that you should kind of see, put in your chat and then hit enter. Um, please remain mute on the line. Um, and in event of any disruption, you know, we will end the meeting early and we'll follow up um, afterward just um, to make sure that we're okay with that. And then, so before we started, just wanna share with you real quick also, um, this Accelerating Climate Resilient Speaker Series. Um, this is the second one for this year. Uh, it has been uh, a very um, hot and rainy summer all at once, but anyway, we're kicking off the series again. So. Um, this will be the first of many in the next few months, so stay tuned. You can go to the website, which Kat can uh, um, dro drop in the chat for you, um, and we'll definitely be sending out emails about the upcoming uh, events as well. So the idea is that this is open to the public so that you are able to join the conversation, learning about innovative um, emerging climate solutions from our experts, from uh, practitioners across the country, um, across the world too, actually, if we can, um, you know, bring folks together in, in the intersection of climate solutions, climate opportunities and solutions um, across the different topic from zoning to housing to uh, equity um, through arts and um, youth movement, some of the topics that we have discussed in the past. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Kat. Great, thank you. I have to find my unmute button. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, like Van said, we have two speakers here today, which we're very excited about. Um, we also have some geographic diversity, which is exciting because we love to feature work here in Massachusetts, but it's equally as valuable uh, to also draw and learn from climate resilience efforts going on elsewhere. Um, so our first speaker is Arturo A. Masaldea. He's the executive director of Casa Pueblo. Um, Arturo is from the mountainous area of Puerto Rico and the municipality of Adjuntas, where his parents founded the community-based organization Casa Pueblo. Dr. Masaldea grew up in this project and has chaired its board of directors since 2007. This community-based project was responsible for protecting the central region and its critical watersheds from an open pit mining proposal and later from a massive gas pipeline. Instead, new forest units, El Bosque de Pueblo and Bosque La Olimpia were designated and have been ever since managed by this community initiative. Thus, changing this island's forestry policy and catalyzing an increase of protected areas from a mere 3.7% to a current 8% of its surface. A graduate of the public school system and the University of Puerto Rico, he obtained his doctoral degree from Michigan State University in 1994 and an honorary degree from Northern Arizona University this year in 2023. For 30 years, he's been a faculty member at the University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez, after the impact of Hurricane Maria through Puerto Rico on September 20th, 2017, almost six years ago, Dr. Mesaldea, together with Casa Pueblo, has led a community aid response that aims to change the energy landscape of a country dependent on fossil fuels to one based on renewable energy sources. So welcome, Arturo. Our second speaker is 
Suri Kayali. Suri is the microgrid manager at Green Roots. Um, he was born and raised in the greater Boston area before attending Case Western Reserve University to pursue a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. He started his career working in New York City as a part of the construction management team for the Q-Line subway expansion. After a national energy crisis left his family in Lebanon without reliable access to electricity for months, Surrey returned to Boston to join the movement for energy justice in and around his home city. He is excited to be a part of the microgrid projects in Chelsea and Chinatown and hopes their successes can act as a proof of concept for communities around the world. Welcome to Surrey. Uh, we're really excited to have both of you here today. Thanks for joining us. Um, I will first turn it over to Arturo to um, tell us about his work with his community in search of energy democracy. I will stop sharing and the floor is yours, Arturo. Thank you, everyone. And, um, and for the invitation to share what we have been doing in, in, in Puerto Rico. I'm from, this, from the mountain part of the island of Puerto Rico. Uh, this is Casa Pueblo. We have been promoting uh, sustainable development, uh, the protection of the land, water resources. And since 1999, we have been, uh, we installed the first solar system that we have upgraded throughout the years. And we are about breaking the model of dependency, especially since we live in, in, in a hotspot for, for biodiversity, that this is Puerto Rico in the Caribbean. And the political context is that we are a U.S. territory since 1898. So since we are a U.S. colony, breaking the model of dependency is very critical to exercise the right of self-determination, at least at the community level. Um, and throughout those years, we have been uh, confronting unsustainable proposals. It's important to say no to things that are very bad to, to our uh, geographic uh, integrity. We pr protest mining uh, proposals and only one person show up in our first manifestation. And we quickly realize that knowledge by itself doesn't change anything. And that's why everything we do is science, culture, and community. Everything we are, uh, that's our social equation for transformation. Uh, eventually, we had to confront another unsustainable proposal, uh, the transition from, from bunker to natural gas by the construction of a natural gas pipeline. We confronted that as well in 2010, and, and, and we protested that and stopped that from happening. It was a very corrupted in multiple ways, that proposal. But we're using our knowledge and, and energy to propose alternative. We propose a forest, we have been managing the forest, we have a radio station, we have a school of music, we are, we're breaking the model of, of energy dependency. I mean, th this is what we're doing on a daily basis in the mountains of, of Puerto Rico. Uh, in 2017, we have Hurricane Maria going through the island almost six years ago. Hurricanes are natural events in the Caribbean. What is unnatural is what happens after. Uh, and what happened after it, it was a power outage that lasted up to a year in some areas in Puerto Rico. And it was a cost of, of multiple uh, problems within the community. Since Casa Pueblo was running with solar power, we became an energy oasis for the community. We distributed solar lamps to help people, but also to educate people on how to yield solar panels to solve lighting at that time. We have been doing homes now that, that they need energy security for critical uh, e e equipment like, like a dialysis machine or, or a respiratory equipment uh, for, for health, uh, for uh, food security and so on. We have power like critical infrastructure, the radio station, the transmission tower, the fire station, the emergency unit grocery stores for food security around the town. We even built a solar cinema to deal with mental stress and, and, and having an entertainment a cinema is, is very important for, for communities to respond under difficult circumstances. This is the elderly home and we have done two of them already 
uh, because this is for us, uh, again, critical infrastructure for the community, the elementary school we have done, uh, La Lechonera, places that people for prepared meals are also running with solar power and, and even a solar forest have been built as an energy oasis, transforming an abandoned lot into with arts and sculptures that are used to educate people on, 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 on solar power, but it's also attracting people to the communities for economic activation is to address other issues for an alternative model for local development. So our definition of resiliency, it's not individual survival, but building up the capacity to respond in an integrated fashion critical infrastructure responding when, when we have a hurricane, for example, of earthquakes in Puerto Rico. And we have been challenged more recently with the pass of Hurricane Fiona a year ago. And what happened is that people that have energy security, they, they were able to sustain dialysis throughout the, the emergency. And, and it's life saving. Uh, having energy security in Puerto Rico. And Casa Pueblo became a model of, of Puerto Rico's resiliency. Uh, I, again, there was a power outage from the centralized power utility, but not in Casa Pueblo. Uh, we were without power for nine months. And Casa Pueblo is a microgrid. Uh, we have Casa Pueblo, the radio station, the solar cinema. Some residents are also depending upon the power generation in, in Casa Pueblo. And, and you can see here, I'm not gonna stop on, on all the details, but at some point we, we, the power was out. Uh, we were depending up, upon energy storage. We were using energy, the sun was coming back the day after, recharging, using, recharging, operating in a sustainable fashion for nine days until the centralized system came back and we became, let's say, not, dependent upon the energy store in, in the batteries. Now we, we were using solar power and interconnected to the grid. With Fiona, we were able to, to, to distribute solar lamps right away. The solar cinema was up. Kids were going to the solar cinema two days after to enjoy the movie and regain so normality after that crisis. The solar forest was an oasis. So students were going there to plug in and get connected to their classes. We have pushed for the right of energy for everyone in the community. So this is a, an example of how we think uh, urban settings should be in, in Anjuntas. Like everyone should have the right of power, even if you're not the owner of this of the company of the of the house. Uh, and even if you don't have the money to pay or finance a, a solar system, yield as much solar power at the point of consumption on rooftop, not farms. We need to use already impacted surfaces uh, so we can yield power from the roof and integrate that into the centralized system. This is how we are pushing for energy democracy. In 2019, with the Hono Foundation, we proposed to power downtown at Juntas where the highest energy demand is the pizza place, the, the pharmacy, uh, two warehouses, the bakery and so on. And we, we have completed the solar installation and a one, a one megawatt energy storage unit. Uh, three out of six installers were female. So we're also addressing the issue of, of gender inequality. Uh, but this is how downtown and juntas look look like from, from above. And, and again, what we have been doing is, is transforming, pushing from the bottom up to transform the, the energy landscape of Anjuntas. There is a solar company now in Anjuntas. They have retrained people in Anjuntas. So, so it's not only about the energy and the solar panels by itself is embracing energy as a mean to, to transform our reality, even the food truck is running on solar power in Anjunta. So, so with that, I, I wish to, to stop at this point and, and, and we'll be more than happy to answer questions after the next presentation. Great, thank you, Arturo. Um, really inspiring to hear about the hard work of your community and 
um, puts in their perspective how closely tied energy resilience is into other forms of resilience like social. Um, and like Van said, folks are encouraged to put their questions in the chat and we'll have uh, time for Q&A after our next uh, presentation. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Surrey to hear more about Chelsea and Chinatown microgrids. Hi. Um, hi, uh, I'm Suri Kayali. I uh, work uh, with Green Roots, which is located in Chelsea, and uh, Chinatown Power, which is located in Chinatown um, uh, in Boston. And so we are uh, developing virtual community microgrids in both of these uh, communities. And so the way they work is um, we uh, are going through various buildings, uh, holding community engagement events and identify and working with the community to identify critical uh, facilities and buildings that uh, would um, be well served by a uh, virtual microgrid. So we uh, are performing building assessments and um, identifying what energy efficiency and um, Improvements can be made to the buildings, uh, things like energy and water, water saving um, measures, uh, assessing the capacity for rooftop solar, and identifying areas where we can install battery storage to uh, help make these buildings more resilient. Um, all of our, all of the buildings we're working on uh, maintain their connection to the existing grid uh, with the idea that in a power outage, uh, they would have backup electricity from their battery storage and backup generators. And then while the grid is operating, um, the microgrid uh, sells power back to the grid and takes um, part in um, demand response programs. And so the purpose, the reason uh, we've opted for the virtual model is because um, it, uh, due to regulatory uh, hurdles, we're not allowed to share power between buildings. And so, um, uh, yeah, so we're not allowed to share power. And um, by doing it virtually, we can um, uh, create a scalable model where we don't have to build the entire thing at once, but rather we can create a program where buildings can be added in over time. And so these are the buildings we're working in, uh, working on in Chinatown where um, you'll see none of them are adjacent to each other, uh, but um, they can all participate by coordinating their loads uh, through a cloud-based control platform. Um, and so the reason we chose uh, Chelsea and Chinatown are because um, both have large designated environmental justice populations. Um, they have large immigrant and working class populations with high poverty rates, high levels of linguistic isolation, and they both have a history of environmental burdens being forced upon the community with um, the mass pike uh, and, um, you know, kind of cutting off China, cutting off Chinatown. And then in Chelsea, they have uh, uh, 90% uh, of Logan Airport's fuel reserves. They have the Tobin Bridge that uh, goes over the community. Um, that still is covered in lead paint, uh, which has been falling onto the community. And uh, they have um, a large salt pile that serves like 300 communities around uh, New England. And all of these contribute in both of these neighbors, uh, neighborhoods to um, uh, some, of the some of the worst quali air quality in the state of Massachusetts and uh, causing them to be some of the hottest environments. Um, hottest uh, communities within Massachusetts. So um, so we really wanted uh, the microgrid to serve as like a community-led way of uh, allowing these uh, communities to become more resilient. Um, many of our community members uh, have family um, 
in Central America and Puerto Rico that suffered power outages um, due, to, due to hurricanes and tropical storms. And uh, likewise in Chinatown, many of our residents have family in New York's Chinatown who were quick to point out that, uh, you know, when Hurricane Sandy knocked out power to New York's Chinatown for three days, uh, the neighboring Wall Street um, neighborhood had power up within a few hours. And so um, most of the people in these neighborhoods are uh, renters. And so, um, you know, Massachusetts has a lot of programs um, for installing solar battery storage and energy efficiency measures to make them more uh, attractive. But a lot of those programs aren't accessible to renters. Um, so that was another reason we really wanted to focus on these neighborhoods. And so, um, We've uh, been working in both communities um, with the city of Chelsea and Chelsea, and then with some of the larger um, building owners around Chinatown. And so we're starting, we're in our initial phase of the project, um, where in Chelsea, we're working in the city hall, uh, the police department, and the city yard to install solar and battery storage in those three buildings with the uh, plan to expand and perform um, additional community engagement to identify what the next phase of buildings are. Thus far, a lot of people have expressed interest in things like the senior center and some of the grocery stores in the neighborhood. And then in Chinatown, we're working uh, mainly with residential buildings, uh, representing it's eight residential buildings representing around 600 units of housing. Um, and so, um, Ultimately, the goals are we want to be able to provide clean and reliable electricity to frontline communities. Um, uh, you know, allow uh, low income people to reduce their energy burdens and reduce their utility bills and really uh, develop this in a community led way. So in Chelsea, um, we anticipate uh, setting up a local board that will manage uh, the Chelsea microgrid. And then in Chinatown, we've created a public benefit corporation uh, that holds um, you know, open board meetings and allows for community participation and decision making. Um, and yeah, so uh, that's all I have if anybody has any questions. Hey, thanks, Barry. Um, yeah, so now we'll, we'll move into Q&A. Um, I think we'll start with some questions uh, from the chat, so definitely continue to put those those in, and we'll we'll get to them. Um, our first question is um, Arturo, can you speak about the measures used to secure the solar installations against hurricanes and other natural disasters? Yeah, well, the the ones that you see on top of Casa Pueblo in my back, they were installed before Hurricane Maria. If they're properly installed, they they should be fine it's an engineering challenge i'm the biologist of the group and i think a, a lot of improvement have been done to to better prepare and secure the the solar panels um there's always a, a risk of something happening uh but if one installation fails it doesn't compromise the rest uh and usually when you have the, the, the orbital infrastructure, if you need to replace a solar panel, it will be faster and easier and one installation that do it for, for the whole place. So, so the risks are, are there, but I think uh, engineering improvement have been done in order to, to fix those solar panels in, in, in a proper way. And, um, and it had been tested before with, with different hurricanes. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. I'm sure there's always improvements being made and, and maintenance is, is always that factor there. Um, so thank you. Um, our next question is, um, sorry, during macro grid out outages, how do you isolate your micro grid if buildings are not adjacent to each other? And how do you determine your grid boundary? So it, it's it's on a building by building basis where each building is uh, islandable. Um, so we're, we're essentially installing battery storage and um, specifically critical facilities. 
um, like the city hall, uh, the police department, the residential buildings. And so um, each building has its own battery that it then transfers over to in the case of a microgrid outage. Thank you. We have such technical questions here today, so I hope we're up for it on a, during a lunch hour. Um, let's see, our next question is, Arturo, could you explain how the investment of the solar panels um, went through and was it private or public investment, donation, government program, um, and how do you work alongside local authorities um, when, you know, upon installation or uh, <laughs> yeah. planning? <laughs> I saw that question. Um, we have suffered a lot of political repression since our origin because we were confronting this model of open street mining and the pipeline. And, and some people in the government, they see Casa Pueblo as a, not a political threat, but a counter narrative. Um, so in our case, we're not interested. We don't work with politicians. We don't work with political parties. We don't we don't take money from the government, not from federal funding, because our main goal, goal is to break the model of dependency, is that to build up alternative from within the community for self-determination. Um, so that has some constraints. Uh, we sell Cafe Madre Isla, I just put the, the link. On, on the chat. If you want to buy good coffee, buy Cafe Madre Isla. And that's how we have been generating the basic income for Casa Pueblo and for everything we do. Uh, our work is with volunteer effort. I don't get paid, not the direction. We have engineers, we have collaborators with, with, the, with the university. Uh, solar panels donations from, from everyone that have seen what we have been doing and have been helping us to help others. Uh, the foundation, Alex Hono, have been supporting the microgrid in, in, in downtown at Home Test. Um, and we have grassroots Oxfam America, uh, the diaspora of Puerto Rico, of Puerto Ricans in New York, LA raising fund money and, and sending that to, to help Casa Pueblo do some of these installations. We're building energy independence. And so that's what, what we're pushing from the bottom up um, with a lot of effort. As you can see, many of the installations are very humble because we don't have a, a lot of resources is with what we have at, at Bridge. Yet the Department of Energy have seen uh, what we're doing with the microgrid in downtown at Juntas uh, and have chosen as one of, of 10 study sites in the US and US territories. And the reality is that our downtown uh, microgrid is actually two microgrids. Uh, these are two different areas in, 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 in Anjuntas, and they're working on designing better technology to exchange energy from one microgrid to another. We know how to share the energy within one location, within one microgrid, but the next level will be to have one microgrid interacting with another one. So in some instances, let's say we don't work with the local government, but we have been engaging with agencies and people, universities and other who are very committed to, to see this thing happening. And uh, we're not afraid to, to work with the Department of Energy either. Jennifer Granholm has been in Casa Pueblo. We have met with her a few times and uh, as she has a, a, well, this colonial obligation to take care of the energy setup of Puerto Rico. So um, hopefully that will answer partially <laughs> that question. Yeah, I think it's so important to highlight how kind of all hands on deck, um, you know, making, building relationships, maintaining those relationships are such a crucial part of a lot of these community led projects and how much inspiration we can take um, and otherwise. So thank you. Um, another one for Sari, um, if you had like a 30 second or one minute feel of what a virtual microgrid is, um, could you help us out with that? Yeah, um, so a virtual microgrid is really our term for effectively a coordinated group of smaller microgrids. Um, so the virtual aspect is from the fact that uh, none of our participating buildings are sharing power with one another. 
but rather they're coordinating their loads um, to maximize the revenue from participating in wholesale markets. Okay, and so is the virtual kind of aspect of that an additional feature that you wouldn't get if you just had battery storage on a building? Yeah, so we're installing microgrid controllers that, um, you know, will um, essentially uh, look at all these loads of the buildings together and, you know, uh, uh, essentially like can communicate with the grid operator to effectively turn the lights off for all these buildings uh, at once. Um, so it's that it's that coordination aspect that that you get from the virtual microgrid. Thank you. Um, and this question I'll throw out to both of you. Um, we can first go to Arturo. Um, can either of you or both of you speak to some of the regulatory challenges around installing energy storage, um, maybe such as fire codes with battery installations or maybe zoning, things like that? Yeah, I, I am the biologist of the group, just in case. <laughs> and so um, in our case, many of the standalone installations are very straightforward. We, we were pushing for net metering in like 15 years ago, and uh, eventually net metering was integrated into the energy setup of the, I mean, the legal framework for Puerto Rico. Uh, what we have seen is that many codes have been added, which are my work for the U.S. because of the uh, constructions and material, but they're not applicable to Puerto Rico, but yet they have been forced into the Puerto Rican code. They have been integrated, making things more expensive, more complicated, and they're being used to, instead of motivate people to do it and participate in energy generation to do the opposite. Uh, the other thing we're getting are threats of a solar tax so as a way to, to keep people you know, on hold. And if you do the investment, perhaps you might be penalized in the future. Um, so we, we have a lot of, uh, I mean, conflicts uh, going on in, in, in Puerto Rico right, right now because uh, the energy infrastructure have been privatized transmission and distribution and also generation so they don't they if you think about that privatization of the electrical grid they want to keep their profit uh growing and as people are producing and generating power their profit gets reduced so there's a conflict with the privatization and the goal to democratize energy generation in puerto rico um on our end um i can say there is uh especially among uh, fire departments a lot of um suspicion around uh battery storage particularly um lithium batteries uh there have been a few headlines about uh, how they can cause fires and so um we've had to you know do a little bit of educational uh outreach towards uh the fire department in chelsea um to you know walk through you know how like the battery chemistry and things of that nature there were concerns raised by uh, city councilors as well um in addition to that we've uh, encountered pretty significant interconnection reviews by the utility um so in order to hook up our batteries to the grid we need to submit an interconnection application to uh, eversource our local electricity provider and um, that review, uh, it took around nine months for them to get back to us and request you know, additional information from our engineers, and then another three months for that to be reviewed and for us to get approval. Um, on top of that, there's a interconnection fee that we need to pay um, uh, that all of this is um, you know, baked into the cost of the pro pro project and the revenue uh, we're projecting to generate from these batteries do pay off that interconnection fee, but it is an added uh, upfront difficulty. Yeah, we've definitely heard um, you know similar stories working with other municipalities. So, thank you. Um, let's see. Another question um, for Arturo is: the storage in Puerto Rico was described as one megawatt. 
Um, <laughs> um, do you mean that the battery can output one megawatt of power at peak? Um, and then if so- For an hour, uh, that's it. Okay. Uh, I'm the biologist. So it's a one megawatt energy storage capacity. I think as far as I understand is that it can sustain one megawatt of output for one hour. Uh, and you have to govern that energy within the within the all the consumers so we have to do a lot of uh, of energy balance and we have like it can work we, we're doing the black start soon so 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 the the infrastructure have been completed now we're going to be adding like businesses to the to the to to the active grid um but we know that that in case of uh, it can work with the central utility, but when it's working as an island, uh, all of the participants they have to 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 do their check. I mean, they, they if we're in a hurricane emergency, they they have to uh, be very careful on how to use that energy, especially when you have hurricanes that are of bigger size because of climate change, and the clouds are out there for longer. Um, you, you get the the solar yield is a solar system, um, but there's some environmental factors that might compromise uh, uh, energy yield production wise uh, uh, related to to, uh, to crisis like uh, facing a hurricane. Great, thank you. Um, next question is for Suri. Based on your experience with the Chelsea and Chinatown projects, what changes do our utilities need to make to help with growth of microgrids? And do you see municipalities using public buildings for microgrids? Um, and if so, how can we, or either way, how can we encourage that choice? So I think some of the key changes utilities could make, um, you know, would be, you know, improving that interconnection process. Um, in addition to that, uh, a lot of the incentives that utilities uh, currently offer for things like solar battery storage and energy efficiency measures, they're all really geared towards um, single family homeowners. Um, it's like nearly impossible for renters to access these uh, resources on their own in a lot of cases. And um, since most renters pay their own electric bills, um, landlords really don't have much of a, of a financial incentive to do so on their own. Um, so I, I'd say those are kind of the, the two key things that really could be modified um, on the utilities end. Um, and then in general, yeah, I think, um, I think using municipal buildings um, uh, as microgrids are, are, you know, it makes a lot of sense. I think it's really just, um, again, so, so, uh, some of the technology is, is newer around battery storage. So um, people aren't like as comfortable with it, but I, I think, you know, over time it, it'll make, it makes sense and more uh, municipalities will adopt it. Um, and going off of that, who, um, how did you pay for and who owns the system um, that that you're working on um, and how do they participate in the wholesale market? So uh, the system is owned by the city of Chelsea. Um, we've been working, at least in Chelsea, <laughs> uh, we've been working with the, the city there and uh, they put down some of the upfront funding and um, uh, some of it was paid uh, by grants uh, from the state, um, but the, the city will be the uh, owner of the uh, microgrid there. In Chinatown, um, the microgrid will be funded. Um, we have a, a green investment partner who is working on the finances with us. And so we're still in the process of dictating the final terms, but it'll be, uh, we're creating a special purpose entity, which in which uh, our, our organization, Chinatown Power, and our partners uh, will share ownership uh, with the um, idea that ownership will events eventually be transferred over to Chinatown Power in its entirety. Great, thank you. Thanks for your questions, everyone. Um, I think with the last 
15 minutes or so, we could talk a little bit about um, both of these projects being community led, how um, community resilience plays into um, the success of these. Um, so our first question for both of you is, how did you talk about the value of resilience to both your community and community stakeholders? And what did you learn about resilience from those conversations? Well, in the case of Puerto Rico, I'm a biologist again, and I love resilience, the concept, the ecological concept. But in, in Puerto Rico, it was mistreated, that, that issue when the government, instead of, uh, of complying with their responsibilities after Hurricane Maria, they're putting the burden on, on individuals and people. And they're saying, because you are not resilient, you're suffering. Uh, we have losses of life because you were not resilient uh, instead of the government assuming the responsibility. So, so it had been mistreated, that concept. And many people in Puerto Rico, they, they don't want to use it. I know the value of the concept and the way we see it is, is again, uh, as community strength, as we have community strength uh, dealing with the different uh, uh, needs, like entertainment, health, communication, uh, if you're prepared with a fire station, you know, being able to, to handle phone calls during Hurricane Fiona and coordinating rescue missions when, when, when it's most needed. Uh, when you have the elderly people, you know, at least with some energy security, people that need uh, dialysis, when you see the, the overall picture and, and, and survival is not about individuals, but about community development and, and wealth being. That's the way that that we have been redefining uh, resilience as community strength. Uh, and we're gonna keep pushing for, for that. Not for, an, for a, a house or a building or for the wealthy people to, to be fine. <laughs> we're talking about, you know, everyone uh, has to be for, for everyone, the right of energy and water security and basic services has to be for every single one, including migrants over there. Um, yeah, well, on our end, um, you know, a lot of our residents don't have like that same direct um, experience with losing power that um, you know, many folks in Puerto Rico do. So it, it can be challenging um, to kind of like relate the importance. Um, you know, they, they see flooding, like people will see flooding, but um, you know, the, the big focus is on, uh, at least in, our, in my experience, a lot of people have been primarily focused with just paying their bills. A lot of people have gone into debt to, or on their bills. Um, you know, because the cost of electricity and energy has gotten so high. And so it's always been like hand in hand that uh, we can help, we can help reduce your electricity prices and make the, make the city more resilient, um, you know, at the same time. Thank you to you both. Um, are, are there specific examples we can talk about? Um, you know, Arturo, you mentioned the community, um, movie theater that that you can see really adds you know specific examples of how um, these projects are adding to community resilience well uh, I want to use the time to take advantage of that question and just to let you know that the infrastructure of the microgrid in downtown and juntas has been transferred to the to the business owners. And um, and now we have the basic services uh, in a better position. Jobs that are created can be sustained. Not be, not after hurricane. Power outages in Puerto Rico are very common uh, for multiple reasons. And and the way the reason that we build that infrastructure with the support of Alex Hono, the professional climber. And Rivian, the electric company, they, they, they provided the support for the energy storage part because they're thinking in second life application for energy storage in the electric vehicles and so on. Um, 
the idea is to is to power that business owners they're going to pay for the energy to themselves uh and that money will be used for operation and maintenance to build up an emergency fund but half of that will be used to help low income families also build energy resilience so it is to is is a is a the microgrid to generate wealth associated to power generation for social reinvestment in the community and keep uh, the pathway to a more resilient community moving forward. Thank you. Sorry, anything to add to that? Um, in terms of, you know, specific examples or maybe lived experiences you've seen your community um, have that have um, their resilience has been increased from the China or Chelsea, uh, Chinatown or Chelsea projects. Um, so, I mean, our projects are still under development. Um, we're, we're still uh, in the uh, design and construction phase. Um, so we haven't seen any of those uh, effects materialize yet. Thanks. Looking forward to hearing about that. Um, great. Another question um, for both of you is, what did you learn that can serve as takeaways for communities looking to post pursue and uh, resilient energy sources? Um, right away, uh, the cultural adaptation, um, you, you need to help people understand the, I mean, education is critical to, to for that companionship to, to the community, the, the, you know, the, the energy relationship and, and it's quite different from being uh, utility driven, like it's endless and the responsibilities is in there. Now, you, when you're controlling energy generation, you, you, are, you have to govern that power and, and you have to be aware, you have to be responsible and you have to think about all the issues. And, and yes, it gives you a lot of freedom and, uh, and, and more justice because now you're producing the power for your productive activities and you enjoy them more uh, in a better position, I mean, as before, but, but, but it, it, it's, it, it's that human variable, not the engineering component. I, I think the engineers, they, they can solve these issues of how much energy storage and the energy efficiency and the interconnection and how to produce the power. I think the, the human factor is, is, is a critical one. Is very complicated, and and we have seen everything in Atlanta. Good examples, negative example. I, I mean, from from left to right, uh, is is highly complicated, and 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 that is like a high level of uncertainty. <laughs> uh, complicates, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, the I'm path sure. for the future. Right, I'm sure that serves as kind of a motivation when you're um, working through all the regulatory and um, engineering aspects. So really important to highlight. Um, anything from you, sorry, that you'd like to add? Um, you know, I think Arturo said it well. It, it can be uh, complicated to explain the project to people, but um, you know, w w once people do wrap their heads around it, they we, we've seen like a lot of enthusiasm from community members around it. Great. Um, all right, let's, let's end with one final question. Um, like to end with a hopeful, inspirational one. Um, what do you find hopeful when you, while you've been working to advance equitable climate resilience? Um, what can you share that's, that's hopeful in your area of work um, that you'd like to leave us with? <laughs> what I can say to you is that it's not just an idea. Uh, it is happening it, 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 and it's working well. It's serving the community of Adjuntas as a reference of what can be done in other municipalities in Puerto Rico and other parts. Um, so so, so the, the ideas can be, can, can, can be translated into actions. And that's what I think in Casa Pueblo we have been doing, the actions. We're talking and speaking by doing the actual trans energy transformation, even under very different 
conditions, and yet uh, I think it has been proven that is the right path that can be done, and in our case, uh, should be done, needs to be done. Uh, so I, I want to also invite you, if you want to learn more about Casa Pueblo, go to casapueblo.org. There's a lot of publications in English as well about what we have been doing. And if you are to visit Puerto Rico at, at some time, uh, feel free to, to stop by in Casa Pueblo. We are open seven days a week. Next week, we're gonna be in Amherst College in UMass and Harbor. So if you're in that area and, and you wanna participate in one of these meetings, we're gonna have a longer presentation in more detailed fashion. So you will be more than welcome as well. Yeah, I, I just echo that. Um, I think you know now is the best time to do this. Um, Solar panels, uh, the cost of solar panels have gone down significantly in the past decade. Uh, battery storage is more accessible. And now some of the funding for, through the IRAs is starting to become accessible as well. Some of it's already accessible. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think the future, the future looks bright for it. Thank you. Um, highlighting that last piece is people kind of uh, start with planning and, and um, and, and thinking about projects in their own community, how can they um, best center and intentionally center equity in the planning um, and making sure that the priority populations um, are directly benefiting from these projects? We can start with either one of you. You have to have them engage from the very beginning. Um, and in order for, to have an effective contribution, they, they, need, to, they need to be educated. Uh, an honest approach and also, I think in the case of Puerto Rico, is, instead of thinking in, in just an, uh, a technology transition from fossil fuels to solar power, I think we have to think about social justice and the ownership of that infrastructure it have to be community owned. It have to be owned by, by people. At least that's the way we have been uh, we have been doing doing that in Puerto Rico because it's about economic activation, climate adaptation, and, and breaking that power structure in which people are just consumers and the victims of someone producing energy elsewhere. Um, so social justice, I think, is, is a critical word in, in, in any discussion about, should be a critical word in any discussion about the energy future uh, of a, any community in Puerto Rico or in the U.S. or the Caribbean or any part of the planet. Yeah, I also think it's really important to, you know, try and try and aim for language justice, make sure you have translators in, you know, communities where uh, you have like multilingual um, residents. Um, you want to, you know, and try, try and avoid jargon um, when talking about these things, try and like break it down in the simplest terms possible and like really try and pursue understanding instead of seeing engagement as just like uh, holding a public meeting and, you know, uh, as like a box to check off. Thank you so much to both of you for highlighting the engagement, education, relationship building piece. Um, those are really important. Um, so yeah, with that, um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, special thanks to Arturo and Sari. We have their links in the chat um, and, and we'll post this, this recording shortly, but Really, really appreciate you sharing your um, experiences with us and your story. So thank you again. Um, and to everyone on the line, um, you know, stay tuned for future events like this and future speaker series. Um, we'll, we'll definitely be showing up in your inboxes. Yes, Arturo. No. Oh, okay, sorry. Same I you had a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. Great, well, yes, thank you everyone. Have a great day and um, yeah, see you next time. Thank you.